Hi guys, we are going to start reading chapter one of The Barren Grounds by David A. Robertson. Okay, after we are done this chapter, the expectation is that you complete this page out of your reading response forms. Okay, so what this one is, is a beginning, middle and end, a summary of what happened in the chapter. It says, picture draw the most important of the court and part of the chapter, please include that as well. You can just draw it on the back of the sheet. Okay, so beginning, middle and end, what were the important parts that happened in this chapter? Paying attention to this, you need at least four sentences for each section. Four sentences. First, next, after that, then, after that, finally. Think of the sentence starters that you're going to use. Don't start every sentence with then, then, then. Don't do that. Fix that. Okay? All right, let's get reading though. Put that to the side. And let us read chapter one. Morgan's head was pressed against her pillow. The alarm on her phone had just been snoozed again and her plan was to leave early for school, was slipping away each time she reached forward with a groggy hand to silent the incessant beeping. Still, she refused to poke around the screen lower where a simple touch would shut the alarm off permanently. She had good intentions to wake up, stay awake, get out of bed. That's how I felt this morning. First day back from spring break. Oh, I just wanted to keep hitting that snooze button. Snooze, snooze. Okay, so Morgan's having trouble getting out of bed. The thing was, she was so darn comfortable. A rhythmic, crunching sound replaced the alarm with this last strike of the snooze button, and a scene of blizzard came into her mind. Morgan was walking through it, across a seemingly endless field. There was a square light in the distance, but she never got closer. When she tried to move faster, her body wouldn't allow it. She kept taking the same heavy steps that led nowhere her feet crunching through the snow. Morgan tried to imagine something else. So this sounds like Morgan has slipped back into maybe a dream, okay? Where she's there, there's a blizzard going on. She's looking through, it says a seemingly endless field. Like she, it looks like it goes on forever in the middle of a blizzard, okay? She can see a, a light, a square light in, the future, okay, in the distance. However, it seems no matter what she does, she's never getting anywhere closer to this light, okay? So she, Morgan tried to imagine something else. She should have been able to. It was not a dream. She knew she was awake. She pressed her eyelids shut so tightly that her entire face scrunched together like a raisin to force something else into her mind, to force herself back to sleep and into an actual dream. But she couldn't get rid of the image or the crunching. Okay, so Morgan is awake. She's not, she hasn't fallen back asleep, okay? She's awake, but yet this is still happening in her mind and she can't get rid of it. She feels like she's in the middle of a blizzard. It's barren wherever she looks. There's a light in the distance and she can't get to it. Okay, and so now she's trying to like wake herself up or just fall back asleep and have an actual dream. Then it dawned on her. The crunching sound had been in time with her heartbeat. With her ear pressed against the pillow, her pulse announced itself forcefully and unrelentingly. All she had to do was lift her head it was a cosmic design to get her out of bed. Morgan kicked off her sheets like she was in karate class, sat up, and the sound went away. She stayed like that for a minute, staring at the white walls, the
the blizzard stubbornly following her even now, until the alarm jolted her into movement. She silenced it again, then checked the time. Good, it was still early. Morgan set about the task of getting ready for school. After all, this had been the plan all along. Morgan's bedroom had a tall, narrow window that faced the street. Opposite the window, in the back corner, just above the floor and beside the headboard, were two pipes protruding from the wall. They were cut down, capped off, and out of the way. She guessed that her bedroom used to be a bathroom, but in the two months she'd been here, she had never bothered to ask, because the answer felt obvious. Where else would you stick the oldest foster kid? The room had thin carpeting that didn't quite match the hallway carpet, which made Morgan think that it had been purchased at a discount carpet store. She had hung clothing, mostly hoodies, on a series of hooks at the back of her door and taped a modest collection of posters to the walls. Finally, there was a floating shelf for her books, fantasy books mostly, old ones, because Morgan liked how books used to be written. She liked the words that authors imagined and how she could imagine herself in them. Pardon me, she liked the worlds that authors imagined and how she could imagine herself in them. She would read books on her bed facing the window. She'd lie on her stomach, kick her feet in the air and get lost. Other times she would just sneak to the attic. There she could really be alone and she could really escape. Escaping was the plan this morning, not just into another world. Rather, Morgan intended to get out of the house and on her way to school, solo. It would be a peaceful walk on her own for once without Eli, the new foster kid. Over the last week, since he'd arrived at the house, it felt like she'd become a glorified babysitter even though at 12, Eli was only a year younger than her. So Eli is a new foster kid at this home where Morgan lives, and she's also a foster child, okay? Eli is 12, Morgan is 13. Morgan got dressed in ripped jeans, a white t-shirt, and a black hoodie, and tied her black hair into a loose ponytail. She pulled the door open in slow motion to prevent any squeaking from the hinges. Success. Halfway there. Now, there was just the matter of the hallway. She took one soft step, then another, all without even a whisper of a sound. Morgan felt like a ninja. To her left was Eli's bedroom. She could see the mound of his body underneath the Star Wars comforter their foster parents had bought him prior to his arrival. The only personal touch in his room, and it wasn't even his. At least Morgan had her things on walls and hooks, and even clothes scattered on the floor. If Eli hadn't been sleeping in the bed right now, you'd have never known that somebody was living there. There was only Eli and the oversized drawing pad he brought with him everywhere. Sorry, I'm going to focus this better for you guys. And the oversized drawing pad he brought everywhere, like Linus and his blanket. More ninja steps followed. The only thing that worried Morgan was Katie and James. Their bedroom was directly adjacent to the stairwell as though they'd known beforehand that they'd have to contend with a teenage girl sneaking around. Luckily, the door to the stairwell was open. This meant all she needed to do was continue on her improbable run of silent steps. She could already picture herself walking to school alone. The sun would be shining, the grass emerald green, the birds chirping, there'd be no snowstorm, no square light in the distance that never got closer, no crunching footsteps. She was almost home free. She put her foot down quietly. If I did want to sneak out one night, I could totally do it, Morgan thought. She'd run away before, which wasn't quite the same as sneaking out. 
Not from Katie and James's place, but from her last foster home, more than once. That was what had brought her here. She took another step. Creak. Morgan stiffened. Maybe nobody would wake up. The peaceful, isolated walk to school could still happen, right? She wouldn't have to look back to ensure Eli was still with her, lugging that drawing pad with him. He was a small kid for his age, so the drawing pad looked comically big, wedged between his arm and his torso. She wouldn't have to try to make conversation with him because he hadn't said much since arriving here. She could just put her earbuds in and take her time. Morgan, James asked from the bedroom, is that you? Morgan sighed. <sighs> Why did James have to have super hu human hearing? Can, yeah. You have to take. Yeah. On the plus side, at least now she could go back to sleep for an hour. Now we have this constellation here, which many of us know as the Big Dipper. When Morgan got up again, having ironically slept in, everybody was awake and breakfast was waiting for her. Arranged neatly on her plate, as though James was co uh, competing in a cooking show on the Food Network, were scrambled eggs, two strips of bacon, hash browns, and a perfectly quartered orange. Morgan's stomach grumbled so loudly that everybody must have heard it. Katie sitting across from her, James sitting to her right, watching to see how Morgan would react to the food, and Eli, to her left, looking down at his own plate. Wait a minute. Morgan inspected the plate of food more thoroughly. The scrambled eggs resembled a mop of curly hair. The bacon strips were decidedly fat lips. Two orange slices were ears, and the final two were eyes. James snorted, trying to stifle a laugh. Are you serious? Morgan buried her face in her palms. Too bad he doesn't have a nose because the food smells great, James said with a guffaw. You know, I'm 13, not three, right? Morgan asked. I think you forgot about that, you know, one in front of three or something. James thought it might. Katie gave him a deliberate side eye. Cheer you up? Cheer me up, Morgan echoed. You've been, you've looked upset since moving here. Almost all the time, James said, glancing at Katie for approval. I, we, we just want you to feel home here, comfortable. But this isn't my home. Morgan said. The last seven places weren't my home either. Do you think? Mar Morgan took a deep breath, a technique she'd learned to remain calm. A breakfast made into a face is going to change any of that? It's just what families do. Katie dabbed at her mouth now as she thought, as though she wanted to wipe away the words she just blurted out. She tried again. <laughs> We're new to this, Morgan. This is our first family. She reached across the table and put her hand in, on James's. It was always just us before you came. So here we see a bit of Morgan and a bit of her anger and hurt of having to live in a foster system, of having to live away from her own home, okay? She says, I've been in seven homes in the foster care system. They're not my home. My home is back where I was born, where I was raised when I was a little kid. We see Katie and James trying their very best to make Morgan feel welcome. But it doesn't look like what they're doing is really helping. But we'll see. We'll finish uh, reading the rest of this chapter in the second video.